So we put on the consultation form the trip on the website where we start recording consultations, trading sessions, and Zoom yeah. sessions. Okay. All right. So, um, sorry, I've been back to back all day. Okay. okay. When you're seeing the um, the behavior towards strangers, uh huh. Um, I know it says in and outside our home. Yeah. When, when, can you explain more on that? Yeah, for sure. So um, he like. There's some people he barks at, and there's some people he's completely fine with. Okay. Um, but when he does bark at people, it's pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. And he's like tried to nip at people a couple times. Okay. Um, but it's not, but like I said, it's not with everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just with random people, and he barks really aggressively and okay. like doesn't listen, like loses all function of listening. Okay. Do you want to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, his bark just like the whole tone of it changes from like mm -hmm. kind of like friendly and curious to like mm -hmm. like be afraid of me. Um, mm -hmm. And then like within the like going home thing, it's like depending on like I don't think we've ever had an issue like we have outside and inside, but it's when people come in, he like we we have it sometimes where he's pretty good about not jumping up, and then sometimes if like it's a brand new person mm -hmm. and he completely goes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When when you see it outside, um, like is it in a hallway, an elevator, like even on the street? On the street, like as yeah. we're passing through our neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. Um, tall people, large people, uh, construction workers. Um, he doesn't bark too too much at women. No, I mean typically it's like just average size. Uh, I mean, police with our neighbor. Barked at him. He barked at another neighbor around the corner who looks nothing like the police. <laughs> oh my god. Um, so I don't really know if there's a pattern. Yeah, I don't know if there's like a correlation between people. Or Men, I guess, would be the only. Yeah. Kind of consistency. Common thread, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but men and women, mostly men, or just like strictly men? I've never seen him bark with a girl. Yeah, okay. I've never seen him bark or be super aggressive with a woman. He's okay. never barked at kids. I've seen. He loves kids. Okay. He loves kids. Okay. Um. What other behaviors uh, are you seeing? Um. He sometimes you know has selective hearing. Oh sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I mean, he's still pretty young. He's only like a year and five months, four months. Um. So we do know that there the. He's still pretty young, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would say like mostly he um, has that selective hearing of like sometimes I'll listen, sometimes I won't listen. Mm -hmm. Also, like a great thing. He yeah. just hates being in his crate. Yeah. Like he was crate trained right off the rip when we first got him, and then quarantine happened, and he wasn't in his crate as much because mm -hmm. we weren't going anywhere. No. But um, now, like our neighbors say, like they can hear him barking like incessantly from time to time. Okay. He's in his crate. There's like now that we're picking back up again, there's really nothing we can do about it, you know. Because he was he was in there and he was sleeping in his crate and all this other stuff, and now he doesn't sleep in his crate and mm -hmm. he sleeps with us and so he has a hard time with that. Okay. Yeah. So we have uh, reactivity towards humans, um, barking in the kennel when you guys are gone. Yeah. Uh, obedient stuff obviously. Yeah. Uh, how's he with dogs? Loves dogs. Yeah. Okay. Do we see reactivity towards dogs off on leash or is he fine? I mean, he always wants to like play with dogs. He definitely, when he sees a dog, he wants to like go forward and go play. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen him be aggressive with dogs. I mean, I take him to the dog park mm -hmm. frequently mm -hmm. and he's fine with people at the dog park. He never bars people at the dog park. Yep. He's never been aggressive towards any other dog. If any other dog like nips at him or shows him that like, hey, like I, I don't want you around me, he responds pretty well to that and okay. goes off and does his own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely just always wants to play with dogs, never really aggressive. The only time there's issues is like some dogs as they're walking by, if they get like nasty with him, mm -hmm. then he'll like, you know, have yeah. to snarl back at them. But mm -hmm. Yeah, he's in the yard. Gotcha. Um anything else? That's most, yeah. yeah, that's most Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you guys find us? Um, I was doing research because um, I wanted to, 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 to 
to a behaviorist and like get kind of like consensus of like what we can do to help them and, okay. and all of that. So I was just doing research and I found you guys online. Okay. Um, I'm assuming after you found us, you did a little bit of research on us and how we train, yeah. the methods we use, and everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else? No. Okay. So it sounds to me like you have a nervous dog. Okay. Uh, human reactivity uh, not very common, um, which doesn't make it bad. In my opinion, human reactivity is actually the easiest thing okay. to. It's usually so reactivity is a spectrum. We have human reactivity, you know, skateboarders, rollerbladers, uh, construction workers, whatever. Yeah. And then we have like calm dogs, excited dogs, uh, other reactive dogs, and then like turning a corner seeing a dog, right? Uh -huh. That tends to be the spectrum that people will deal with. Whenever there's human reactivity, it's almost always the first thing that goes away. Okay, and then everything else kind of goes in that same kind of order. Okay. So other like reactivities with other dogs or set of runs with dogs is usually at the end of the spectrum because you can't plan for it. So since he doesn't have reactivity towards dogs, that just makes things easier. Okay. okay. Out of everything that you're, you've explained, the hardest thing would be most likely separation stuff. Okay. okay. It's an easy. There's an easy answer. It's just just how people feel about things. So I'll explain. You know the approach and everything. Okay. But with a guy like him, um, the re reason why I'm saying nervous is typically when we have a dog that's reactive towards a human. It's almost always nervous. Okay. If it was fear-based, um, like you would be able to take them anywhere. You'd be scared of everybody. Okay. okay? And an anxious energy um, tends to not be able to settle. So like right here, like he, I can see that he's unsure. I can see that he's under stress. I can see that he's insecure in this environment. Uh -huh. Like he's tucking into for comfort and stuff. Right. But he's able to settle, right? And he got up and he sniffed and he sniffed me and he went back and I ignored him and stuff. Yeah. So um, my assumption is most likely just a nervous dog. Okay. okay? And him having reactivity to like, for instance, just men is not uncommon. Okay. Uh, men tend to give off a more threatening presence than uh, what women do. Yeah. So that's actually you know pretty common as well when it comes to human reactivity. Okay. Um, so here, the, the tools that we use, of course, are Prom and e collar. Any dogs over six months or puppies over six months, we train on these tools. Okay. The reason is because, in my opinion, they're the most effective, the most efficient, and the most consistent. So there's, there's a, a lot of different training methods out there. The three primary ones would be like positive reinforcement only, which is food-based, uh, toy-based stuff. Then we have like gentle leader, prong collar. Uh, gentle leader being the positive reinforcement tool of choice, prong collar being more so like trainers like myself, uh, self uh, tool of choice, and then e-collar, okay? So positive only is great for puppies under six months. It's great for foundational stuff. It's great for stuff you want to see again. Uh, it can be helpful with counter conditioning. Like if I have a dog that's like, uh, we want to build trust between a dog and a person, like food can help, but isn't like the end all be all tool, okay? Um, it has the lowest ceiling in terms of reliability. Uh, so like if you were to get off leash or if he's at the dog park playing with his friends and you're like, hey buddy, come. And he's like, and you have chicken and he's like, well, playing with my friends is more valuable than the chicken, mm -hmm. right? Well, if he doesn't get the chicken, like he's not gonna, care because he doesn't relate like oh man like I'm missing out on chicken right? right he's just like this is more fun at the moment okay so there's no means for you to make him return uh, with prong or gentle leader better because we have uh, a tool that allows us to physically control the dog more of like a 40 to 60 percent kind of success rate the problem again is if you take the leash off we no longer have connection we no longer have control okay. e-collar on or off leash we have control Okay, so obedience wise, for me, it's the ultimate tool because it doesn't matter if the dog is off leash, I still have a means of control over my dog. Okay, uh, the other thing is when we're dealing with dogs like him who are nervous or insecure, it's non confrontational. So, prong collar, have you ever seen one? It's like the spiky looking collar. Yeah, yeah. my sister uses one for okay. her. Okay, yeah, so it's a great tool, but when we get a nervous dog and he starts to be reactive, he's not being reactive for the sake of being reactive, he's being reactive because something made him feel threatened okay. and he's putting out the fence and he's like hey like back off i don't want uh, no, i don't want to hurt you i don't want to hurt me right okay. so if we correct him technically in his mind he's not doing anything wrong and it can make him more nervous okay. because it's complicational because it's physical when it comes to remote caller uh he doesn't know where it's coming from okay, okay. It's, 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 uh, so if I correct him for the reactivity, it's not, he doesn't relate it to me. 
right? We relate it to something else. Okay. So it allows me to correct the behavior without putting confrontation on the dog. And confrontation is healthy. Yeah. Uh, when done correctly. Yeah. It's just in certain situations, it can make the dog more nervous, it can make the dog more fearful or whatever. And we're trying to help him understand that he doesn't need to be nervous, okay? So with a case like him, when it comes to the human reactivity, uh, to address that, the first thing that we teach, just uh, also just in general, is always the heel. Okay, so the heel is walking at your side. So a couple of things that are working against you are actually the flexor leash and the harness. Okay, so harnesses actually promote or uh, create more reactive or aggressive responses. Dogs have a thing called opposition reflex, which means when they feel pressure, they want to go against it. Okay. So if you pull back, he wants to pull more forward. Mm -hmm. When we create that conversation, it creates agitation and frustration. Okay. okay. So I've had so many clients through the years, they get a puppy, they put the puppy in a harness because we want nothing, of course, inhibiting the throat. Um, and then whenever the puppy sees the dog, they pull their puppy back because they don't want the puppy jumping all over the dog and annoying mm -hmm. them. And then the puppy starts to bark and like, I want to play. So it becomes, you know, it's frustration. And then over time, frustration becomes agitation. And then eventually oh, agitation can become aggression. Mm -hmm. So over the course of a year, a very friendly puppy all of a sudden becomes a reactive dog, aggressive dog, okay? And it's a very common thing that I come across. Um, we also use it in protection training when we teach dogs to be aggressive on command. Uh, so like we'll have a person holding the dog on a leash with a harness because again we want nothing inhibiting the throat and then somebody will be across agitating the dog creating suspicion and as the dog starts to lunge and bark you'll see us pull back on the dog to create more frustration because we're distancing the dog from the threat mm -hmm. and then we start to build that and shape that into controlled aggression okay it's how like they train the police dogs and all that stuff yeah. protection dogs that's what we do okay so the harness can create more reactivity the flexor leash pair with the harness gives you the least amount of control, okay? So flexor leash is, gives the dog too much freedom, okay. but then also just the um, trying to control him using that handle, and when they become reactive, can become a problem. So like right now when you're trying to come into the threshold and he went back, right, and you had to essentially just pick him up because trying to pull him forward, all this stuff puts the leverage in his favor. Okay, so then there's nothing that allows us to actually make him do something, mm -hmm. which is ultimately how he gets over these things, right? Okay. So if I bring him, you know, ideally, like, let's say if I have a dog that has issues with different floorings, I would want that dog to be able to walk through different textures mm -hmm. without any limitation. But they have to do it. Yeah. It sounds silly, but if you pick a dog up and go from one place to another, they don't know how they got there because they didn't do it themselves. Okay, so it remains always a factor for him of, I don't like this final floor in, okay? okay? He has to, with his own calls, cross the threshold and walk through it in order for him to go like, oh, I don't have to worry about this. Mm -hmm. This is this is fine, I can walk on it just like anything else, okay? Which also comes across to me as a more of a nervous tendency, yeah. okay? So, with this particular case, the first thing that I would cover is the heel, because that's gonna help address the reactivity it's also going to help address or give us something to address the uh, the issue with like certain floorings and stuff okay? mm -hmm. and, and getting to learn how to just move forward so when the brain goes into resistance which is hey i don't want to go into that room mm -hmm. we use what's called pressure work pressure on when we need the dog to do something or stop doing something pressure off once they comply okay so if he goes back and says i don't want to go forward we would have the e-collar we start low our goes to 127 and in, in increments of 1, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 127. So I'm at, I can start at like 10 and I start putting pressure on him with the collar to motivate, motivate him to move forward, right? Maybe he doesn't, he's just sitting there and you'll see like the neck moving because of the stimulation. Uh -huh. So you go 10, 15, 20, 25, and then maybe on 30, he walks forward and he crosses the threshold, but then we take off the pressure. Okay, so when he goes into, I don't want to do it, we put pressure on and we help guide him using the leash. And then once the brain decides to move forward, then we take the pressure off. So he goes, oh, if I try to go away from it, it turns on. When I move with it, it turns off. Plus nothing happened with the floor. Right. Okay, and then we would repeat that a few times. Eventually he just walks in and out and he's like, oh, okay, this is not a problem. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the reactivity stuff, uh, without any frustration on the chest or tension on the chest and stuff, 
uh, we should remove a lot of that frustration. Uh -huh. We should see that reactivity go away. The exceptions would probably be, at least in the beginning, like let's say you're walking and then some big guy was like, hey, nice dog, and like started talking to him. Yeah. Because now there's, there's more uh, spatial or uh, social pressure being put on him, you might see a reaction, right? But walking past people or walking past men or whatever, all that stuff that we typically see, all that stuff just starts to go away once he understands how to walk at your side with no tension, okay? So heel fixes like 70 to 80% of problems. That's why we always teach that first. Okay. Slight, slight possibility it can help address the barking that we're seeing when you're gone, but I'm gonna lean more towards probably not. Okay, okay? It's, it's rare that it does, but it can happen. Okay. And I'll explain how we'd address that. Okay. So, um, are you guys familiar with how the e collar what the e collar technology is? Uh -huh. no. Have you ever been to a chiropractor or a physical therapist? No. I actually haven't. <laughs> Have you ever um, seen those uh, infomercials for the, the you put on your stomach and it exercises oh, yeah, to make yeah. you can get abs as you watch TV, right? Yeah. So that's what's called a TENS unit, T E N S. Okay. They use it in chiropractic offices, uh, physical therapist offices. Uh, they use it for sports rehabilitation therapy. Uh, they use it to break up scar tissue on muscles. Uh, they use to ease back pain or relax your muscles. It's just a, it's, it's a muscle stimulator, okay? So it makes the muscles move. So people typically think of an e-collar as electrocution. They think they're shocking their dog. They think it's like putting your uh, finger in an outlet or something like that, or like the electric chair, and that's not the case at all. They use the technology on humans, okay? So you can go to Walgreens or CVS here, and you go to the back section, and you'll see a little section that says TENS units, and it looks like a little bone and you put it on your back and when you turn it on, it moves your back muscles to help ease back pain and to help relax and tight back, okay? Uh -huh. So the e-collar is the same technology. It's just a muscle stimulator, okay? So it's electric but not electricity is how I explain it. So only the muscle that the collar is making contact with will move. So if I have it here, only this would move, okay? If you put it here, only this would move. We would see nothing anywhere else. It's a fully waterproof system. Uh, depending on the size he, he needs, it can go anywhere between half mile to a full mile range. Um, and I've used it with dogs with seizures, heart murmurs, medical conditions, all that stuff, old dogs, 12 year old dogs, whatever. It's perfectly safe because it's just a muscle stimulator. Okay? It's really the notion that people have when they come into it, when like, oh, like you're electrocuting the dog. I'm like, no, like, that just tells me you don't understand the technology at all. Okay? So the reason why I offer these tool, or this tool is because one, it's the most effective and efficient. It's consistent. I don't touch the dogs anymore. I just train the owner. So like all my clients that come through, it's verbal coaching. I'm there with them and I'm telling them what to do, but it's them doing everything with the leash and the remote themselves, okay? okay? Uh, it very easy tra easily transfers from one person to another. Um, right off the bat, like I had a client that had the first class a couple weeks ago, and between that class and the second class, their dog was off leash and got into a confrontation with another dog, and they were able to stop the confrontation by using their collar, right? And they only had one class, but they had enough insight to know, like, oh crap, like, because their dog's 90 pounds, mm -hmm. so if it would have escalated to a dog fight, it would have been a pretty bad dog, bad dog fight. Yeah. But they were able to address it. So even off the bat, they had off leash control when their dog was confronted by another off leash dog, okay? So when it comes to applying it, people tend to think punishment. They go, oh, we're gonna make secret be bad or whatever, and then we're gonna correct them for being bad, which is an approach, but it's not the first approach. Mm -hmm. okay, the first thing we always do is teach the form of heel and go, what does this fix, right? Once you know how to walk correctly, we do that class one, I'll give you some homework, come back class two. What did we see? Oh, Jesse, it was like 60% better with reactivity. And I'll say, tell me when you became reactive and you'll give me the context. And I'll go, okay, sounds sounds normal. So we're gonna do this, we're gonna make a couple of changes, we're gonna teach the second half of heel, uh, and then I'll see you in a week. You come back a week later, how are we doing? Jesse, even better, right? We should see continuous progress. Um, sometimes it's a complete 180, where the owner will have the first class and they come back, they're like, we haven't seen anything, that was been great, they go, perfect, but we'll just continue with how we were planning to continue, just, just teach more stuff, uh -huh. okay? Otherwise, behavior is always a variable, um, my assumption is, from experience, your reactivity is pretty quick, pretty quick turnaround, mm -hmm. is that within a couple classes, it's a done deal. Doesn't mean that it will be, 
but from experience, that's typically how that works. Okay. Um, this, of course, is pending you are doing the homework. You know, if, if you leave and you do the homework somewhat, we're, we're not going to make any progress. Right. Okay. Um, so, the problem or the most common thing that holds people back is they don't they feel like they're hurting their dog, mm -hmm. or two, if they have to go higher to deter a behavior, uh, they're uncomfortable with going higher. Okay. So the caller, like I said, goes to one twenty-seven. So like, let's say we're working with him and. I find during the training, like, yeah, your dog needs 75. Because you're logical, you're gonna think, man, 75 at 127? They're like, wow, that's crazy. Right, because you look at your dog and, you, and people see the sweet dog that they see 99% of the time, right? Yeah. That they have a hard time relating, like, wow, do I really have to go to 75 for my dog? And then when they come back, and they're like, I'm like, how'd it go? I'm like, oh, yes, it was a terrible week. The first thing I ask is, well, how, how high did you go in the collar? And they'll say, like, oh, 50. Like, well, 50's not 75. Yeah. Right, so there's the, the emotional component on the owner's part. Yeah. Um, the reason why, you know, these tools are effective is because dogs are physical animals. Uh -huh. You know, if he did something like you mentioned earlier, he responds well to corrections. Right. Yeah. So if he's at the dog park and he's being too rambunctious, the dog might snap at him. Uh -huh. And they're not being aggressive; they're just saying like, "Hey, you're being too rambunctious around me. Yeah. Take it somewhere else." Right. So it teaches your space. Right? But there's no there's no harm no foul there. The dog just goes, no, back off, and he goes, okay, and he goes into something else, right? Yeah. So e-collar, I like to think of it as like a bite on a button. Yeah. It allows you to correct behaviors you don't want, but also allows us to teach things that we need, like the sit and the down and the come and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Question so far. I forgot to mention one thing we do have an issue with too is like parking outside of windows. Oh sure. And like that's like something we really need to like work on just because like uh we just don't want it to be locked for our neighbors and stuff, you know, and so when they go to sleep, they, they don't want to hear him like barking really loudly at like, you know, when we, we go to bed like a, a lot later than them because she's a principal, so she has to be up early. And so like, we, we try to like make sure he's quiet, but like if you see somebody out the window and starts barking really loud, you know, there's very little we can do in that moment to like, even if it's like five seconds. You know, it's still really loud. It's sure, sure wake her up, or you know, sure. what I mean. So we're trying to, and like when we're driving in the car, obviously too, it's just really loud because we're in a car and oh, it's like yeah. right in our ear. Oh kind of like somebody will be like walking by, and then he'll just like start barking, and then it's just like super intensely loud. Yeah. So that's something that we wanted to work on as well. Um, when he's barking in the car, what is he barking at? Just people walking just by. Just people walking by. Okay, so the same. Okay, that comes from a more of a territorial place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's separate from the leash reactivity, but um, it's possible that the reactivity in the car can go away with the healing exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, if not, I will give you a means of correcting the behaviors. The hardest one would be barking when you're gone, and then barking at night. Because if you're already in bed and he barks out the window, you technically have to correct it. Right? The teacher might like, don't bark out the window. Right. But you're also in bed. Right? So then you have to get up. You can you correct, correct it with the e collar? You can. The only issue with the e collar is that, I mean, you can get a comfort adapter. Is every two hours you have to rotate it because of dog to develop pressure sores. It's not from the stem, it's from two probes poking in the neck. So there's a special adapter and I can send you the link for that stuff. Okay. Meant for extended wear. Okay. The other thing is, in the home at some point you'd like the collar to go away, mm -hmm. right? Is I don't want to make you dependent on the collar. Because right. so the easiest way to explain this is do you guys drive? Yeah. yeah. Do you go to the expressway? Yeah. yeah. Do you go to the speed limit? Yeah. Well no, no. I go I go to the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> so most people don't go to the speed limit, right? right. Yeah. Um, and then when you get behind someone who is going to speed limit, you're yeah, off. Yeah. Uh, it's called opportunistic behavior. All animals do it. Uh, it's part of survival instinct. So, like, if there's a pond of water and there's an alligator in it, and the animals know that they won't drink from that water because they know there's a threat there. When they see the alligator leave, everybody comes and drink the water, and then when the alligator comes back, everybody leaves again, right? That's opportunistic behavior. So, same thing for dogs. Think of the e collar as a cop on a collar. So, when it's present, he's going to behave himself, and then when it's not present, he's going to push those boundaries, mm -hmm. okay? Just like with humans, right? When there's a squad car, everybody all of a sudden remembers the speed limit. But once you pass the squad car, everybody's speeding again, right? Yeah. So um, when it comes to the remote collar, uh, you can absolutely use it to correct the barking. That's not a problem. The only problem would be you remove it, he's probably going to be barking, right? 
So I would give you other methods of correction to so you don't become dependent on it. Yeah. Um, we tried the, the the noise thing, you know, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't register with him. We've got like three of them. Yeah, we bought three different ones. Just he, and he just he does not affect him whatsoever. Yeah. He just comes up and looks at it and it's like why why are you buzzing that and then goes off the system. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Because it's just the sound. Yeah. There's no real deterrent to it. Right. So like I was raised old school, I was spent. Yeah. So, you know, when my mom would say like, "Hey, don't do that," it didn't really mean much until I get spanked for the first time. Mm -hmm. Right now, don't do that. Head, wait. And now, I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to get spanked again. So if I listen to mom's warning, I'm good. Right. Right. So it's the same thing for dogs. The sound is just the sound, unless there's something tied to it, and of course, something physical, because right. dogs bite each other. That's why a lot of these things don't work. You know, get people spray their dogs with water bottles. Uh, you know, sound. Yeah. Things, whatever, putting their dog in kennels, shaking a can of pennies, like all these things, redirecting their dog with a toy, and they're still struggling with problems. I'm like, yeah, because if another dog cared that Sigrid was barking out the window, they'd walk up to him and they'd go, boom, don't bark out the window. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's really, that's what's missing. Um, it's just that physicality aspect of it. And it's not abuse or anything like that, because that's the other people's thing that people struggle with. It's like, oh, these my dog. Like, no, you're not. I'm like, You've already tried all the other stuff, and we wouldn't be here if it was working, right? right? And I go, because also dogs don't do that. Dogs don't give each other treats. Dogs don't sit each other down at the dog park and say, hey, this behavior is not acceptable. Please don't do that here, right? <laughs> dogs don't give each other fluoxetine or triazidone or a pet or whatever. Right. They just bite each other. They regulate each other. Right. So uh, that's the disconnect that's happening, happening to this world is that people, it makes people feel good to think that they could fix something using only sound or, or, or food or or, any, or or like anything that's not mean mm -hmm. right so to speak and it doesn't make it mean like i don't think my mom's mean for spanking me right like it, it, it hurt it hurt but the intention was not to hurt me right it's just, just teaching the lesson mm -hmm. so that's the same thing for dogs so i give you other options to correct him to deter the barking behavior so you don't become dependent on the e-collar mm -hmm. okay? okay now it's potential again that when we do the heal and gets discipline, that some of that stuff starts to tone down. Okay. Okay, that is a possibility. If not, not a problem, we have answers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to when you're leaving and he's barking, unfortunately what makes that difficult to work with is that it happens when you're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and what you mentioned about like, he used to be kennel trained and then COVID happened, so he's not in crazy so much, and now we're visiting the crate and he's having a problem, right? Super common, mm -hmm. okay? So all my clients during COVID, uh, or puppy owners and stuff like that, I told them, you know, crate your dog, if you would work nine to five, yeah. keep your dog crated nine to five Monday through Friday. Even if you're not leaving, put your dog in a separate room and do that. Because when you come back to normal life and you have to leave, it's gonna be same structure except now you're leaving, mm -hmm. right? So it's easier for them to transition to. So here for this guy, um, I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna assume that again, the, the healing most likely won't help. But what there is is what's called a bark collar. Mm -hmm. It's the same technology. It's like an e-collar, except every time he barks, it goes off automatically. Okay, right. so it would correct them. And then what you find is after a couple of times, the heel just like, okay, crap, I can't bark. Okay, now the problem would be, of course, you remove it. He's like, oh, the cop is in here. Now I can bark again. Right. Okay, so that's going to be. Uh, how would you say that's the kind of con to it? Yeah. Usually, what I recommend for people is they keep the collar on the dog anytime they leave uh, for like two months, and every time they leave, just consistently for two months, and then they experiment with removing it for little small periods of time to yeah. see if the dog can handle being left alone without barking. Uh -huh. If the answer is nope, they keep barking, then they go, you know, it is what it is. But your dog needs the bark collar on your dog. Right. It doesn't make it bad. It just means he needs more in order to keep him relaxed. Okay, because the other thing is, he might trigger if he hears like a neighbor walking or whatever, he hears something knocking, whatever, yeah. hears something outside. It's so, like I did a consultation earlier with someone, same problem, dog, dog barks a lot, but what happens is they hear someone outside and then they trigger and then they don't settle down. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we can't teach them the difference. We can't teach them, like, hey, buddy, at least when you're gone, yeah. don't bark at these sounds, we can bark at these sounds, right? It's if he's gonna bark, he's gonna bark, and if he's not, he's not. Okay. So, questions about that stuff? Um, do you, so with that one, do you need like, if you're gonna, like, let's say we're gone for like four hours mm -hmm. from work, 
Do you need one of those like comfort adapters too? Correct. Yeah. They the way they make them, they make them standard with the pros. In my opinion, I'm like, why not just make them with the comfort adapter? Because you know people are going to use these for an extended period of time. Yeah. My assumption is it's business and it's just more money for them. Yeah. Right. The adapter itself, uh, I believe, runs like 35-ish with tax for the bar collar, and I think the bar collar is like 135-ish with tax as well. Uh -huh. um, so that's like uh, around 170 for that package for just the bar collar. Uh, there's no bar collar, e-collar type of combo, at mm -hmm. least not yet. So that would be like another separate investment. Mm -hmm. So typically what I tell people is I go, let's have the first couple of classes and see what what changes in his behavior we see. Mm -hmm. And if we're lucky and it's like, yeah, his barking stopped when you leave, I go, great, then we don't need to buy one. If it's like, nope, it's still a problem, then I send you the link. And, right. And the so you guys have your own e-collars that you would, we would use while we're here kind of thing. And then... No, you purchase your own. We purchase our own. Okay. Yeah, yeah, if you show up and you don't have one because it's late or something, we have ours that you can gotcha. borrow. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, you need your own training tool. Um, so uh, we see how he does for a couple of weeks. If it helps address the barking when you're gone, perfect. If it doesn't, I can send you the info for the bark collar and we can help you uh, figure out how to you know, fit it and all that stuff. And then I would just say, give it a couple months, always use it, and then you can start to wean them off. Because okay. these things kind of work together. Because he's getting disciplined from you guys in terms of in the home and stuff. And then he's also getting disciplined when you're gone. Uh -huh. And then we see if those two things together, uh, after a couple of months, we can start to wean off the bark collar. But every case is different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Um, I mean, ideally, I feel like ideally, at some point, we want him to be able to be out of the crate. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, also, too, like, what's wrong with the crate? Like, if we're gone, like, is yeah. it, like, perfect world, like, dogs should be running around walking around, or is it, like, perfect world, they could be happy and comfortable in their crate? Right, yeah. so, when it comes to the crate rule, yeah. My whole thing has always been, uh, for the first year of a dog's life, whether you get a puppy mm -hmm. or you get an adult dog, that first year you have them, they're always crated when you're gone. Mm -hmm. Overnight is a variable. Mm -hmm. If the dog is potty trained, I don't care about overnight. But definitely anytime we're gone, the dog is crated. Mm -hmm. For puppies, it's because they go through so many developmental stages okay. that they'll like chew stuff and destroy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and for dogs that you just rescued, because it's a completely new environment, they tend to be under stress and they don't know the routine and they don't know who you are, that mm -hmm. they also can tend to be destructive, right? Mm -hmm. So a year, one, if we're dealing with the puppy, it allows us plenty of time to, to get past all those developmental stages. For an older dog, a year is enough time for them to learn the routine. Oh, you leave Monday through Friday, nine to five, but you always come back, mm -hmm. right? So then a year in, you can experiment with having them out, mm -hmm. and if everything's fine, we're good, mm -hmm. you know? There are some dogs that just can't handle being out the crate. They're just destructive for the sake of being destructive. And I'll tell the owner what sucks. I know you mean well for your dog, but your dog doesn't care about your things, so <laughs> best to just crate them, right? right? And I had a guy, his dog, he had a chocolate lab that chewed up a $10,000 leather sectional. <gasps> and when I did the consultation, he's like, I want you to train my dog to not chew my sectional because I just ordered another one. And I was like, I'm not gonna do that because I know your dog is gonna chew it up again. I was like, what I'm gonna do is crate train your dog because that's the only way your dog's not going to be able to chew your sectional. Yeah. Okay, so it just depends. If the issue is barking and he's actually fine when you're gone, yeah. then all you really need is just a bark collar, right? Because he's fine. It's just if, if there's destructive behavior, then they go, yeah, we definitely want a crate. But if the problem is barking, mm -hmm. then really a bark collar, he could be loose. It should be. Yeah, yeah we did like this like gate thing. Well, she did this gate thing while I was because uh, I was. Uh, Way at work in a different state, and so I was flying and she was by herself, and so she did this uh, like put like the pen like, mm -hmm. the, around the crate so he can go in the crate and around the pen. Mm -hmm. Um, but he like managed to get out <laughs> because the pen fell mm -hmm. or something, he but yeah, knocked it over. And so, anyway, this long story short, he was free, <laughs> sure, and he came home and like nothing was destroyed, you know, or anything sure. like that, nothing was chewed up. So, I mean, it was like it wasn't like a bad sign, like oh. The one time he got out and destroyed a bunch of stuff, he just came home and he was like sitting on a couch. So. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I leave that you know to you guys as personal preference. There's more than one yeah. answer to that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, the only thing would be if you ever have to go out of town and board him anywhere. You know, if he's not been crate trained, it could be a potential problem for them. Mm -hmm. for you sure. know. Yeah. Uh, it's happened to us a couple of times, but I mean we're a training facility, so we just tell people like you know if your dog's not crate trained, you need 
permission to correct your dog and stuff because we can't have that here. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you know, uh, there shouldn't be any issues. Um, I'm pretty, like, I'm strict about a lot of things, but there's some stuff where I'm like, well, if the dog just barks and it's fine when they're loose, just have a bark collar and they're fine. Yeah. Like, I had that with another with the consult earlier. She said the dog barks when loose, but when she put the dog in her room, the dog was fine. And I was like, just put the dog in the room, then. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because their neighbors complain. I'm like, all right, something right. easy, and to put the dog in the room. Yeah. So, uh, that's something that we just play by ear, okay. you know? But definitely, you know, I'm on the side of always crate training because you never know when you're going to need it. Okay. Um, but uh, we'll just have to see how it progresses. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then I saw that you have daycare services right <laughs> too. Because um, we were thinking about maybe like every so often just taking them to daycare mm -hmm. to like have a day for ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw online that it's like a three day evaluation. Evaluation. Correct. Okay. So the evaluation um, is to warm them up to the environment. Okay. So like here, like he's already getting kind of comfortable coming up to me and pushing my hand and stuff like that, right? Because yeah. yeah. a lot of times, even with like really social dogs, uh, they get stressed out. Because it's like, you know, you're going to Jesse's and you're going to be a camp perspective for a day, right? And he's just like, where the hell am I? Yeah. Okay, so they tend to be stressed. So we do three days to warm them to the environment. Okay. So the first day, uh, he's handled by all the handlers here. They walk him around and stuff, take him to potty. He'll do treadmill time, they'll play ball with them or whatever. Okay. But he won't do any interaction. Okay, with the dogs. He'll see them, he'll be with them, uh -huh. but he won't do any interaction. Even with social dogs. Okay. Uh, or even if the dog is a social dog. Mm -hmm. Day two, we start to push more. Uh, we bring them around other dogs, other dogs will walk around them, so on and so forth. He kind of goes in and out of kennels and stuff to see the dogs around them. And then by day three, we start to integrate him one-on-one -on -one with dogs okay. to see what's his personality tech like, what's his play style like, bounce and everything's going well. Yeah. And then after that, we'll say, yep, he's good, bring him on by. We do get some other dogs that we know are social, like we have one that's actually here today. Who is social? She plays all the time in the dog park with other dogs with her owner. Uh -huh. But here, because it's a new environment, she's only been here, this is her fourth or fifth time, uh -huh. she's still unsure. So she doesn't, she wouldn't do well with a bigger group. She does well with one to two dogs. Uh -huh. But we'll eventually get her to the point where she can be social and just run with the dogs. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's, you know, even though you see one thing with your dog, it's not always that same thing when they come here. So we ease them into it slowly, okay? okay. Uh, if you did training, you know, you could bring them with this collar and stuff. We also reinforce training here. So all the stuff that he learns, we would, you know, uh, address here. If he barked in the kennel here, we would correct it. Okay. So everything stays the same. Yeah, Okay. that's great. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, other questions? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, in terms of cost and length of time, it just comes down to how much you're trying to achieve with six figure. Yeah. Uh, the way I operate is I go, I hear your story, what you're needing and wanting, I look at him, what I feel you need and want, or what you'll need or whatever, uh -huh. and what he needs. Okay? Yeah. Yours sounds pretty straightforward. Yeah. So you're like in the six, nine to twelve week range. The six week range would be just focusing on the on the stuff that we need. Okay. We need to learn meal for sure. That's typically two classes, okay? okay? If the reactivity is going really well with that, uh, and we're making continuous progress, then we can just continue as planned. Okay. Uh, you know, we I'd probably ask you, like, how's the crate thing going? You may say good or bad. Yeah. Maybe say bad, and I'll say, like, let's just put the, the bark collar on them. Uh -huh. Here's the link, whatever. Yeah. The next couple classes would be um, recall, which is common cold. Okay. So heal and recall, the two most important commands we're about to learn. Yeah. So that's two and two, which leaves five and six, okay? What we do with five and six really just depends on how he's progressing. If for whatever reason we're struggling with certain parts of the reactivity, we can use those classic course to keep working on that. Uh -huh. If all that's going good, the obedience is going good, the recall is going good, then we can teach more obedience. You know, if you want to teach him like go here and don't move while we guest come over or whatever, uh -huh. we can teach something like that. Um, otherwise, you know, if his behavior is taking more time than anticipated, then we cover the heel, the recall, and then probably focus on behavior. Okay. The nine and 12 week program is the nine week, we're more so, we're like guaranteed to cover more obedience because we have more time to work with him. Okay. And then the 12 week program is like, you want all obedience, sit, stay, down, come, place, heal. Okay. And we build it up to off leash reliability. So think of six week as we walk our dog, we go to the dog park. Nine week as walk our dog, go to the dog park, go to restaurants. And 12 week, we do all that because we go hiking, go to the dog beach. 
our dogs will be with us we'll go to our friend's house or maybe my dog goes to work like you do a ton of stuff with your dog mm -hmm. that you need the most control okay so you, any one of those are, are an option for you but the sixth class one is where you fit in in terms of keeping it simple leash walking uh recall and reactivity right okay okay because um, the barking when you're gone thing i'll just say that by a bar caller there's no point in really spending time on it okay okay gotcha um because i had the same question earlier the girls like can you know they said pre train the dog yeah again and i was like well you're just going to spend more time just the option is either put a bark on your dog or put them in the room yeah you know so uh other questions no i mean so like to so what you're saying like i mean personally i would like to have them at that level where we can do all those things that you're mentioning you know <laughs> Um, because we do have like pretty social life and we don't want to be one of those people that we're like, yeah, well, we can't do this or we're afraid to bring our dog around because you know how he's going to act and you know, yeah. we'd rather have like the, you know, role model dog for the other dogs, you know, mm -hmm. and so people can be like, well, how'd you do that? You know, well, sure. Versus being the people like, oh, our dog going crazy and we don't know what to do type thing, you know, sure. like we do live like obviously by a bunch of patios and things like that mm -hmm. and we want to be able to enjoy that lifestyle and have him, you know, be with us so, you know, yeah. we can, you know, just spend more time with him in the summer instead of having being locked in the house and he can just, you know, accompany us places, that would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's the goal for sure. Yeah, so, um, so then if you know you want full control, you know, 9 to 12, 12 is the absolute, like we do everything. Okay. And then 9 is kind of like uh, in the middle. Yeah. So you can mull that over and kind of just let us know. Okay. Um, if some people do six and six, because they want to, they want to see like, well, what will we get with six? And then they'll go like, oh, we'll do the next six. Okay. If you did that, just as FYI, six classes, if I remember correctly, is nine fifty. Okay. So if you did another six, it would be another nine fifty. Okay. If you commit to twelve up front, uh -huh. it's I believe sixteen seventy five. Okay. So you save like a couple hundred dollars. Okay. So when you're saying, yeah, we're going to do 12, you get a cheaper per class rate, yeah. as opposed to if you do six and then you wait a bit and you come back and do six. Yeah. We also had another client who did who did six in the fall mm -hmm. and is taking a break and committed to 12. Yeah. So they already paid for 12, they did six, and they said, we'll come back in the spring. Okay. Right, because they were like, in the winter, we're not going to do much. And I said, that's fine too. But they said, we're committing to 12, but we only want to do this, and then we'll do the next half. And I said, that's fine too. Okay. okay. I don't care what you do. But just so that you're aware of that. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, one of the most common questions I get is like, when does the e-collar go away? And in my opinion, when you need it, it doesn't. Right, so going back to that uh, police officer squad car example, right? Yeah. When do you think humans will ever get to the point where we won't need laws? Right. right? And law enforcement. <laughs> no. Right, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and we know better, yeah. you know? So with dogs, you know, again, it's that cop on the collar. Yeah. It doesn't mean that he's always wearing it. It just means here we're going to the patio, put the collar on. We're gonna go for a walk, put the collar on. We're gonna go hiking, put the collar on, right? That's gotcha. all it means. If he's a great dog inside the home, you don't need it, right? So, it had nothing to do with my skills as a trainer, it has nothing to do with uh, the methods or anything like that. It's just again, just opportunistic behavior. Uh, you're not always having to use it. Yeah. You know, it's just present. And in the case of an emergency, like I don't like knowing that I don't have full control. So like I'll walk my dogs through Logan Boulevard here over back in August, October. Mm -hmm. And my pit hates fireworks. She gets super scared. And someone blew up a firework when I was walking my dogs. Now, thankfully, they were on the leash. And I didn't have her collars on because I wasn't going to let them go off leash. And my pit got spooked. And I was like, great. Now I'm going to walk back two miles. And she's in flight mode. She's, in that, and she's anxious, like, oh, i got to get out of this. Yeah. And I had no means of getting her back under control because I didn't have my tool. Okay? So random things like that do happen. So even with the e-call, I mean, with the e-caller, even in an emergency situation, you still have a means of regaining control, okay? Yeah. That had happened to people, dogs were made because of fireworks. A uh, dog took off after a rabbit because they were playing and the rabbit just took off and the dog just went. Another dog was almost ran into a street before we even covered recall, but the owner was able to get the dog back because she had the collar on. So a lot of stuff can happen. Yeah. Uh, so as, as long as you're doing your homework and following through and, and you're applying everything, you're not always using it yeah. over time it becomes less mm -hmm. but then it's just present because he'll know like okay the cops here so i have to be obedient mm -hmm. okay um other questions is there for the for the like the 12 week program mm -hmm. do you do you offer like installations or yeah. is it okay mm -hmm. it's not all at once correct gotcha. what we typically do is is half down and then we split it up i believe it's half down and then a, then you get invoiced and then before your third payment and i think before the fifth 
class. You can talk to Maria. Okay. She, she, I don't do the invoice or anything like that. But from <laughs> last remember, I think that's how we structure it. Uh -huh. But we do break it up, I think, into three. Okay. And then, of course, your uh, consultation, you get a credit for that towards your program, too. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so Maria will take care of all that stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, in terms of the collar that he would need, he is how big? He's like 40. 45. Okay. Maybe, maybe just under, like 44. Yeah. Was he 44 last time? So uh, you have two options for the collar. One is meant for 70 pounds and under. One is meant for 70 pounds and over. Uh, the 70 pound is under one, I believe is 287 ish with tax. Uh, three quarter mile range, fully waterproof system. Uh, that one, the only reason why I, I, I present the other one as an option is the uh, 287 one is like a box. So it can be, it, on his neck, it'll probably be like a big old, you know, little block there. Yeah. Um, and then the other one that I believe is like 325 ish with tax, uh -huh. and it's curved. Okay, so if you care about aesthetics and how it looks, it just tucks in more nicely. Okay. Uh, and also it's nice to have more power just in case yeah. in, in an emergency. Uh -huh. We have to factor in, you know, if he's running away, the motion and it's jostling the collar, he might be under stress, so he's like, hey, I gotta get away from this. Yeah. Uh, also dogs are physical animals, so that he might override that as well. Either one of those tools, I'm confident, will have the power for it. Uh -huh. It's really just your personal preference, okay? okay? Uh, and then the more expensive one has a one mile range, so more than obviously more than enough for the average family pet. Oh, yeah. Fully waterproof system, both the transmitter and the receiver. Oh. Okay, I've had mine for going on eight years, no issues. Uh, the most common problem that there is is that the battery is a rechargeable lithium battery, oh. much like your cell phone. So then after a couple of years, three years or so, the battery might give out. You just go on the website, find your caller uh, or remote, whatever, find the battery you need for it, 20 bucks or whatever. And you can open it up and replace it and you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. They also come with the warranty. It's one year and I think if you get on Amazon you can expand it to a three year. Okay. Um, so that's another thing that comes with it. Okay? Okay. Uh, anything else? Um Oh, I was gonna ask about him sleeping. Should so when we go to bed at night, should mm -hmm. he be in the crate? Do you advise he be in the crate? Yeah, so the first year of a dog's life. Or like, let's say you decide today, like we're gonna revisit the crate we're gonna implement it. Yeah. Today, and then for a year, you know, he's in that crate and stuff, yeah. and then you can start giving him more freedoms. Okay. Okay. Uh, and just see how he does. Okay. Um, the overnight stuff, if, if there's no potty issues, yeah, it's personal preference. Yeah. Okay. But definitely, the more time a dog spends, I know people they feel bad because like, well, the dog's in the crate overnight, then the crate when we're gone. But dogs are denning animals, and they sleep 16 to 20 hours a day anyways. You're just picking where he's doing it for right. part of that time. With the, the only thing with that is like the barking is hard. So like bark when he's not like, so like, do we crave him, ne like does it matter if we crave him next to us or like in a separate room? Shouldn't. Yeah, it's just, I wouldn't, if you crave him in a separate room and he barks and then you move the kennel to your room next to you, and then you can like, do that, that's a problem. Right, because then he learns if I bark, you're going to move the kennel and I'm going to be closer. Yeah. Is you would commit, right? So if I put him in a kennel in a different room, uh, I would correct that behavior, whether with the e collar or whatever you know um, options I give you to correct that, mm -hmm. or I just proactively move the kennel into the room to make it easier. One to correct if he does bark, but also most dogs tend to be fine when they're created next to the owner or whatever. Yeah. Um, if it were me personally, uh, I would hold off on the crating until you have your tools, mm -hmm. and then you start the process of like, okay, now we're gonna create you in a separate room. Okay. So that this way you have the tools to of course correct them and stuff, and you're not working against yourself. Right. Okay, because a few more days of, you know, doing what you've been doing isn't gonna hurt. Right. So, uh, anything else? No. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Maria would get in contact with you. Okay. Uh, she'd send you a form and then you know you let her know what you want to do. In terms of when you can get started, it just depends on your availability. Yeah. Uh, my schedule is typically opposite, like evenings and weekends are my busiest because people are back to or getting back to normal nine to five schedules. Okay. Yeah. Time would actually honestly be Okay. Better. Yeah, anytime yeah. yeah. before yeah. like uh Two. Yeah, anytime before. Cool. Two. Yeah, so she can get you in even sooner than this because um, not many people book during this time. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, you know, as the weather changes, because you know, originally we were training at Oz Park in yeah, the summer, exactly. which was great, but now it's too cold over there. Yeah. Uh, now there's too much snow to do, like Palmer Square or whatever, mm -hmm. so we do meet here. But, like, as soon as the weather lightens up and we start to, you know, be able to go outside again, uh -huh. we can go right back to Oz. 
And then when it comes to like transferring obedience here to outside is really the logical. Um, E-collar makes it very simple. So like if 20 is great for him here, but outside where there's more distractions, maybe his number is 40. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just raise the number is all it is. Okay. okay, so it's very logic based. And once you understand it, you can pretty much just take them anywhere. Okay. Okay. And then we'll get an email with all of those resources of like yes. the e-collar and like- Correct, the, just like you're making models and then you can look into them and select the one that you want to go with. Okay. He, he would do fine with either one. Okay. You know, if you don't want this big box on his neck, then the more expensive one is nicer because it's curved. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, it would be more than enough for him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, anything else? Uh, so I got him like a comfort muzzle just because I was like scared that it was going to bite somebody. We haven't used it yet, but I just got it just in case mm-hmm. because I mean, I'm just afraid to like take him on a walk mm-hmm. because we have, we have a yard. So mm-hmm. we've just been letting him out in the yard. So mm-hmm. we haven't really walking him. But like, I'm just afraid like, is, would that be bad to use or is mm-hmm. that like, you know, would that like have any negative effect on like, what we're doing or what we plan to do with this training? Nope. Um, what I would suggest though, um, is start muzzle conditioning. It, even if we end up not using it, it's better to be proactive and just start that process because muzzle conditioning can take time. Mm-hmm. And it's simple. It's just like he's eating his food out the muzzle type of stuff, okay? And I'll, I'll try to remember to tell Maria to send you that information. Okay. But if, if I forget to tell her, you can just email her and say, hey, Jesse said he'd send videos on muzzle training. Okay. And then she'll give you the link, okay? Cool. Uh, but it's definitely not a bad idea. Um, how has he been to the vet? Yeah. How's your vet? I mean, I it's mean, hard to tell because they've been yeah, doing the, we, like, they take him, okay, and then we don't get to go in. Is there any yeah. activity there? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, it's funny. He's going to the vet tomorrow, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but he he usually, you know, we meet them at the door, and he'll usually go in and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But and they've never mentioned anything of like problematic behavior okay. before COVID. I mean, he was two months when we got him. Oh, sure. So I mean, he was pretty like skittish just because it ended he was a baby and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, but he usually is a good boy. Um, he's not very reactive to shots at all. He doesn't like yip or anything. He, yeah. yeah. So he's pretty chill. Yeah. Let's see how tomorrow goes. Yeah. Because um, they're typically like they're, they'll tell you like yeah he was a problem. You yeah. Know? Yeah, they so, never told us that he was a problem. Yeah, but he I'll, goes every like couple months, really, for different shots. And, you know, different yeah, we have to do like a re-up on his shots or something. I don't even remember what it is. But I'll ask them. I'll make a point to ask them. Tomorrow sure. Yeah. To see how he is. Yeah, with the muzzle, too, like in the beginning, because uh, I have other dog right now. Yeah. That's the if it's the same. Like, we have to rebuild trust, yeah. right? Like, on, from, from you to him. And also just trust in your skills as a handler. And, yeah. like, the, the trust in the training. Oh, well, it's making a difference, right? Yeah. It is that putting the muzzle just takes off that anxiety of having to worry about what if, right? Because it prevents that liability. Yeah. Uh, allows you to be able to push more. And then once you get to a point where you're like, hey, like, we're good, we, we don't need it. Yeah. And then you can remove it. You know? okay. So it's, yeah, that's not, it's nothing good or bad. It's, yeah. If it helps you feel better, absolutely. Like I'm not against it, it's okay. definitely a tool. Uh, anything else? And moving forward, like with like, cause it's funny, it's like literally we just got this leash yesterday. We've been using a regular <laughs> day, <laughs> But I mean, yeah. would, it be, would it be bad to keep using this leash? Like, if, is there a proper way to use it? Or like, just like, is it just better to just use a regular? Use a regular, because for a couple, there's three things with flex leashes. One, um, the tension can break. Mm-hmm. If you're to put too much tension on it, um, and there's a whip, so like it can actually uh, cut you. Oh, yeah, okay. I've had it happen to people, like their legs are all scarred up because the, the flexi broke and it just mm-hmm. came back and whipped them. Two, there's also, also a risk of amputation. And the third one is, I forget the third one. I know there's, there's the whip, there's amputation, and there's, I think, probably choking. But if you look on the flex leash box, it'll, it'll have these uh, warnings. But it gives you very little control. A regular standard four to six foot leash, you know, is fine. And then uh, for now, you can use the harness and stuff that you've been using. Uh, but then once we get started with the training and stuff, we most likely just use his regular flat collar okay. and the remote collar. Okay. And then go from there. Okay. okay. Do we, uh, would this collar be strong enough for what we're doing, or do we need? Is to that have... a snap buckle? Uh, it's a clasper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my, I always tell people. Um, so technically, once he's trained, technically what you walk him on doesn't matter. Right. Right. But when it co- comes to snap buckle collars, and I had this happen five times last year, is if there's too much pressure put on it, they break. Right. Okay. So I always recommend flat buckle or. Um, belt buckle type collars. With the loop. Yeah, because those are secure. Uh-huh. They, these tend to loosen up over time, 
So then you'll tighten it, and then they loosen up, and then you tighten it, they loosen up, or they break. So technically, after training, it doesn't matter. But if you want as much security as possible, you know, you can do a flat buckle, or you can keep that and just get a slip chain. Mm -hmm. It just slips over the dog's neck, so he can't okay. get away from it. You clip your normal leash to that, and then you just have your e-collar, and you can just slip it on and off whenever you do your training. So there's a number of options there. That's the kind of we have the dog growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They call it like a choke chain, but it wouldn't have any training value. It's more so just the ease of putting it on them. Putting it on and off. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then the e-call, of course, do all the work. And if, um, did you happen to watch any of our training videos? I haven't yet, no. So if you want to get a feel of like what it looks like, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh -huh. lesson ones are always great to watch because uh -huh. it's no one knows what's going on. <laughs> um, you know, the dog doesn't know, the human doesn't know. Right. And that you see me coaching them and it kind of gives you an idea of like how effective it is. If you happen to watch a video where like, hey, this looks pretty shitty, it's because we're dealing with a dog that has behavioral issues. Right. Okay, so the stable dogs, pretty smooth, pretty straightforward. Dogs with behavioral issues, uh, like leash reactivity and all that stuff, yeah. tend to not go as smoothly. Uh, so I always just tell people that just in case, so that this way they don't think it's the e collar. It's not the e collar, it's the dog. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Cool. Anything else? Cool. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh my god. Alright, so Maria will get in contact with you guys. Awesome. And if you have anything that you forgot to ask or if you need to, you just let us know okay. and then we'll get you that information, okay? Cool. Sounds great.